Once again, friends, how are you doing? I hope you're well. I'm Christopher Snowden, and you are joining me for a swift half with Snowden. It's a half hour, little informal chat show where I talk to somebody I'd like to get to know a bit better. I'm very excited to say that this time we have um, Dolly Theus, who is a political activist and is currently doing a PhD in public health. Dolly, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing? Very, very well. Very excited to be here. And as I already said, I put on my party dress just for you, Chris. You're, everyone is always better dressed than me and has a better backdrop. <laughs> I need to find somebody scruffier with a with a, a shady, shady backdrop. But uh, never mind. I look good. Make nice to make my guests um, uh, look and feel better than me. So, Dolly, let's get straight into it. And we're not beating around the bush. You are a nanny status, aren't you? Tell us how, how you got into that kind of thing. Did you fall in with a bad crowd? Yeah, I mean, you know, terrible, terrible times. My parents are obviously very disappointed. It's a, it's a bad addiction to have. Um, <laughs> no, um, it's so funny, the kind of term. I'm so, I'm fascinated to hear kind of how you would even define the kind of term nanny state, because I see it now, obviously, dealing with this kind of topic area every day, talked about or used quite a lot, but for very, very different things. And I... I guess I would put the question back to you. I will say my interpretation in terms of nanny state stuff is, I guess, more about telling people, like nagging people about what they should do, when in reality, quite a lot of the stuff that I um, am interested in is about how do you shape things so that you make it just easier for people to do certain things, live better lives, healthy lives, whatever it is. And um, so that distinction, I, I'm kind of curious what you think about it, whether that is something that resonates in your understanding of, I guess, what a nanny state-ist person perspective is. Well, I suppose I would describe it as having to involve coercion. I mean, the phrase nanny state comes from the 1960s. Somebody in The Spectator, I think, coined it, probably to do, I suspect, with smoking. But I think there was a lot of coercion around in 1960s with smoking. So it may simply be nagging. It might have just been public health information campaigns. And this guy was saying, I'll just leave us alone. You know, um, things have obviously ramped up a lot since then. But I think the government coercion is the key element that I would object to. The, the kind of forceful paternalism. Education, obviously, I'm OK with. A certain amount of uh, messaging bordering on nagging, I think, is is reasonable. Um, but you hear this a lot from people in public health about making the healthy choice easier. I think it started under Blair. But the healthy choice has never really made any easier. It's just made relatively easier by making the unhealthy choice very difficult or more expensive or more inconvenient, which isn't quite the same thing. You're just making it, you know, it's a rel relative shift. I would be happy if they, you know, these people genuinely tried to make anything easier. But it's very difficult to do. So what kind of things do you have in mind with, I mean, you, you deal mainly with kind of diet and obesity. So what needs to be made easier? I yeah, I mean, yeah, this is the major question. And I, again, find it so fascinating because I think you know your status in terms of the public health perspective. You are the kind of person always there with the, um, with the probing questions and the kind of alternate explanations. Um, but I actually find it really, it, I mean, really important, really useful. We know our, we are aligned in terms of our um, philosophy hero being John Stuart Mill and, and someone who absolutely advocates for different perspectives and there not being one truth and you've got to come in together and debate things and be genuinely open to alternative ways of seeing things and everything that you've just raised I feel like I don't know a single person in the public health community that would disagree with the concept of there should absolutely be more efforts made in terms of actually making the healthy option or is it whatever you're trying to solve healthy option in terms of physical activity whatever it is make it easier but in reality that is so so difficult and I find it fascinating looking at the actual practical side of I guess policy interventions around that sort of thing of how much like if you were to weigh up the proportion of policies that are about taking something away or reducing something versus actually provision one, the question is how easy is it to do both of those? Because if it is much, much harder, maybe that is a reason why it's not done as much or you know, whether there are certain like obstacles, political obstacles, whatever it is that you have to overcome in order to make that happen. Um, and two, whether that is just a, a, a default of a mindset in terms of where you focus. Is it more on, on 
you know, taking stuff away than it is on provision. I haven't done the analysis. I should go back and go and see, because I looked at all obesity policies over the last 30 years and do the analysis of what, you know, what proportion is, is about active um, health creation versus taking away. I would genuinely be, be very interested in that, but I'm definitely with you in agreement that it would be, we need to see it actually be easier. But what that looks like in practice is much harder. <laughs> Because your PhD, obviously you haven't finished it yet, but as I understand it from what you've written about it already, you look at all the possible health policies put forward in Britain over the last how many decades, and there's a staggering number of them, isn't there? Like hundreds of them. Yeah, almost 700, 689. <laughs> These are distinct policies, diff different to one another, not just repetition of the same kind of thing. Lots of repetitions in there. So the, this is one part of the PhD. The idea was basically, I was actually very shocked that this hadn't been done before. Um, and in fact, I'm now really interested in seeing it be done for basically any policy area and have been kind of talking to other people about encouraging them to do the same. Because where do you go to find out what government has ever done or proposed about a given issue? There kind of isn't a place to go. And so you have to rely on these discrete studies if they even exist. I naively assumed, of course, there would be like at least one paper out there that sort of says this is what the government has proposed so far. And it turns out that there basically haven't been any papers really like that. The kind of closest to it was sort of very highly selective in terms of the policies that it had analysed. But if we're going to start understanding issues, whatever they are, you have to understand what government has proposed so far. Like, has it proposed almost 700 policies or actually has it only proposed 15 on another issue? And why is that, that it's only focused on these sorts of things? Obesity is, has been such a talked about and kind of high salient government up the government agenda issue for so long that that's not surprising that there have been so many um, policies proposed. But um, as I said, there, a lot of them are repeated policies, which also indicates that they either haven't been implemented or there is a very short term memory <laughs> when it comes to government policymakers thinking this is a new shiny idea. And in fact, the kind of biggest takeaway from the whole study was the fact that we're almost more likely to see government propose another strategy containing almost the same policies that have been proposed previously than to actually implement the ones that they've already proposed. So I've now become an implementation fanatic. Which, so which ones? You obviously got a lot of choice there. Which ones should have been implemented definitely, in, in your opinion, which would have really in, made a difference? In terms of policies? Yeah. It's, okay, so this is a fascinating question, and I've actually just um, written to someone about it who's been asking about this. So the kind of fallacy of evidence-based policy is that you will build the evidence on, I mean, this is, I'm interpreting this in terms of the common understanding that people talk about when it comes to evidence-based policy. They see that as you build the evidence of how and if a policy what intervention works, and then you implement it if it works, and then that's like job done, solve that problem, move on to the next thing. When in reality, that's almost impossible in many, many situations. You might have the evidence of certain risk factors to a problem, like if it's smoking, um, if it's a lung cancer and it's smoking rates, and we know that smoking contributes, that's a risk factor you can look at. So how do you tackle smoking rates is, is what you would do. You might not actually have evidence on whether increasing the price of cigarettes works, or you might not actually have evidence of whether a tax, like whatever it is, works in practice until you actually introduce those kinds of implementations, uh, interventions. And it's the same, it gets harder when it's at a population level. So you can't like do a randomized control trial of a tax. And what I find really interesting, and I'd be curious whether this is, because this is definitely up your street in terms of things that you point out um, about given policies, is that understanding leads government to, or appears to lead government to be much more risk adverse because it sort of goes, well, we don't have any evidence on how this policy intervention will work. And it's like, well, you won't <laughs> until you implement it and find out how it works in practice. But what you do have evidence for, which is what it can be considered or makes it considered evidence-based is evidence of the risk factors. And so I'm kind of trying to, 
it's such a hard thing to communicate. I mean, this is a good test of whether this even makes any sense talking about it now, but the concept of a natural experiment that government should be encouraged to be more innovative, entrepreneurial, experimental by saying, we can't guarantee that this intervention is going to do X, Y, and Z, but we think it is based on whatever reasons. And then what we're gonna do is monitor and evaluate it over. So when I look back at all of the government policies, I was like, the lost, um, I guess the loss from having 30 years and almost 700 government policies is that we haven't implemented so many of them and then been able to kind of build up of the evidence of how they would work if they work. But haven't they been implemented in other countries? I mean, there's a lot of countries in the world that could try these things out. We can't be the, the forerunner of everything, surely. So we no. must have evidence from abroad now. Totally have evidence from abroad. I mean, the sugar tax is a really good example of one that, that there were sugar taxes introduced all over the world, Mexico, Chile, South Africa, you name it, um, before the soft drinks industry levy was introduced. But then even that raises so many questions, not only about contextual differences in terms of the countries themselves, that can be in relation to like the demographic, you know, how healthy is the population itself, where the problems lie, that taxation system, the political system, all of those contextual differences can play an important role in how a policy then plays out in um, the UK or England or wherever you're um, implementing it. And then on top of that, the soft drinks industry levy was a very different design in terms of it wasn't necessarily a consumer focused tax, i.e. hiking the prices, it was more about incentivizing manufacturers to reformulate. So again, that sort of adopting policies, if they have been introduced in other countries, also need to be contextualized and understood in relation to whatever. I mean, and that goes for even regional assemblies or like city level, I mean, right down to the local authority level. So I would be, I would err on the side of caution when it just comes to retrofitting or um, copying policies that have been introduced. Do you, you think that the sugar tax in this country, which came in 2018, I think, you think that's been a success? I mean, in, in terms of reducing the sugar content of drinks, yes, hasn't impacted um, negatively the uh, the producers and manufacturers at all. In fact, they've done very well to diversify. I think, in fact, Coca-Cola has gone, um, I should know these stats off the top of my head, but have absolutely benefited <laughs> from... Yeah, because they didn't get rid of the sugar. It's one of the few companies that didn't get rid of the sugar. They actually advertised the fact that they would not be getting rid of the sugar. An AG bar that makes Iron Brew saw its share price fall about 40, 50%, and it's never recovered. I mean, so Coca-Cola's done all right of it, yeah. By diversifying the portfolio. And I think that's one of the interesting things about this whole, um, and I remember us having a conversation about this, of kind of what comes first in terms of um, public opinion and what people want and where you see those sorts of culture shifts occur, what ignites them. And I guess I'm, again, fascinated from the historical perspective of what initiates that kind of change, where we move to, like, what is the vision? And I guess I'm, I'm unclear with when it comes to you, because we have so many agreements that people might find surprising in terms of what we would consider the focus that should be in terms of policy, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess we're driven by different visions of the future. And my vision of the future is one broadly and simplistically, which is easy for anyone to live a healthy life and without having to think about it. And certainly without that having to mean that they're living some kind of boring, <laughs> you know, it's restricted. There's always an image of public health people wanting like everyone to eat rabbit food and um, be active all the time in a, in a non-pleasurable way. <laughs> I just want Ribena to taste nice again. <laughs> why can't we have that but chris why is that too much to ask what do you want from life really <laughs> how much has the obesity rate fallen by since the sugar tax came in this this great public health success oh my gosh well that gets into you know how you measure outcomes and this is the other funny thing and you've got such a complex long-term issue as uh, obesity and also i should say that part of the learning that I've done over uh, the last few years in terms of really getting into this issue area is the kind of concept in relation to um, weight uh, around this whole thing. And I've shifted much further away from the focus being on weight to a focus on health, on how can you make it easier just to be healthy regardless of weight. The weight thing is a very specific type of policy intervention that's required in terms of for helping people that 
currently live with obesity, particularly severe levels where it is almost impossible to be able to, um, you know, tackle it in our current environment and sustain it without that being very, very difficult. And I'm seeing friends at the moment going through it and, oh my gosh, going on whatever the, uh, you might have seen the Daily Mail article, going on um, eight to 16 week uh, liquid only diets in order to get the weight down and then mating like keto, goth, like very, very, very hard. So I see people go through that and yet we then put them back into a world that makes it very hard to maintain that. And I would just love it if the world made it much easier. But I noticed you didn't answer, answer the question of how much obesity fell by after the sugar tax. The answer, of course, is it hasn't. But that's all children. a complex area and no yeah. one is going to be contributing to uh, a reduction in obesity rates. As but you see, I'm a very simple man, Dolly. When people spend <laughs> years campaigning for a policy on the basis that it's going to reduce obesity, I expect the outcome to be that obesity is reduced. And in public health, that's considered a very gauche and naive way to look at it. It's not in medicine. In medicine, if you're given a pill for something, if it doesn't work, then you say that the thing doesn't work and maybe we shouldn't be distributing it to people. In public health, they seem to get away with a lot more and start saying, oh, well, yeah, it's just only one part of the picture. We need to do a lot more. We do this, 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 and this, and then maybe obesity will come down, perhaps, which is known as the whole systems approach, isn't it? Can you explain for our viewers what the whole systems approach is? Because I can't really, even though I've read a few studies about it. I know you know what it is, Chris. <laughs> well, not really. I couldn't. I mean, if you wanted me to define it, I would say it is basically firing an endless number of unproven policies at a problem in the hope that it might, you know, between them, they might have some kind of positive effect. I'm afraid um, the, the beauty and downside of human nature and our complex world is that there isn't really any such thing as one solution to such global problems like a pill for climate change or a pill for... Well, no, I wouldn't expect one policy to get rid of obesity completely, obviously, right? We've got nearly 30% of people obese in this country. I think if you've got, you know, 10 different policies, maybe each of them will reduce obesity by 1%. That's apparently far too much to ask for. So, I mean, how actually are we going to reduce obesity? Assuming that is a suitable aim for government, which I don't really think it is. But assuming we, we let's, if we targeted halving obesity over the next however many years, what would we need to do to achieve that? That's what I never hear from public health people. It's just piecemeal. It's, well, we, we'll do this policy and then we'll do this policy. And we don't hear what the, the end goal is. Well, we know what the goal is, it's to reduce obesity, but we don't hear like how many policies do we actually need in this whole systems approach in order to bring about the desired amount of obesity. And if you take all these policies together and look how costly they are and how much they reduce freedom, actually, do we, are we that bothered about reducing obesity by 5% if it's going to require state control of the food supply? Is it, I mean, you raise a number of very interesting questions <clears throat> and I mean, essentially, there is no set answer on the 10 top policy solutions that are going to um, solve, you know, tackle the issue of obesity or reduce the prevalence. Because it's a complex issue, because of going back to what I was talking about in terms of knowing how things work, you kind of have to implement them and monitor them and evaluate them to see what uh, intended and unintended consequences occur as a result of it. But what I would say is, again, coming back down to the issue and separating the issue of um, reduction of obesity prevalence to actually creating a world which makes it healthier, uh, easier to be healthier for people, which again will be more in the kind of preventing future generations from having uh, such a high prevalence of obesity rates within them. So separating the two, firstly, if you're tackling people in terms of current obesity rates, you have to support people that currently live with obesity. Uh, or who are on route to that. So whether that's um, tackling other issues related to type 2 diabetes rates, which may not be with people who live with obesity, they might just be overweight, they might not even clock in as overweight, but um, be living with type 2 diabetes, which uh, is linked to all sorts of other um, problems. That is much more the treatment focus side. And again, you would have seen most recently, the government has introduced um, uh, the 100 million pounds for uh, weight management services. So these sorts of things are, there are different grades of uh, weight management service from like weight loss classes right up to bariatric surgery. That's very, that's a very broad overview, but lots of various things offered within that. Those aren't mandated. Um, so there are lots of local authority areas where if you're a person living with obesity, you might not have any of those services available to you, or you might only have the very, very minimum 
um, level of services available to you. Uh, that 100 million, when you start to actually unpick it, is only available for 12 months. So on average, to set up a tier service, it takes around six months-ish for a local authority that hasn't got a certain tier weight management service to set that up um, to do so. If they only know that they're going to get 12 months of funding and they might have to find the money <laughs> and they're already scrapped for cash for everything else, it might not be the kind of long-term solution that they need in order to build sustainable weight management services. So a policy like that is such a good example of where in practice, when you're trying to tackle the issue of uh, people currently living with obesity, i.e. the treatment side of things, that in reality, it's much more difficult. We're talking long-term massive investments needed to provide- yeah, it's more expensive, exactly. Which is why governments don't tend to do these things. They do the and things then, that they can bring a bit of money in with, like the sugar tax. Well, then there's on the prevention side, which is, I see it more as like the cultural. So you've got current um, population living with obesity or at risk of or whatever, the needs specific support, more treatment focused support. That's I guess where people see the health when we talk about health policy, it's what they tend to think of. Yeah. And then I see it as like, okay, what happens when you help someone in a situation like that, you know, whether it's reversing type two diabetes, getting into better health, whatever, where do you, when you return them back to society and their day-to-day -day lives, how can we create a culture and environment that allows them, enables them to maintain that as easily as possible. And that's where, these kind of policies like the advertising, promotions on biscuits, all that kind of stuff. It's these little uh, exposures as they're called, or, you know, kind of, I almost see them as triggers around us that increase your chances towards a certain product. That's how advertising works uh, and promotions work. If those were in favor of a kind of healthy diet, we may be more likely to see that actually played out in terms of people's diets themselves. When are you going to start doing this with your own Twitter feed? Because I notice you're frequently posting pictures of you outside pie <laughs> shops or ice cream shops or enjoying a dessert. Don't you think you should be leading by example here? I knew what you would say that of my two photos. <laughs> No, there's been more than that. I'm a QPR supporter. Just moved to West London. How can I not celebrate the local QPR buying that shop opening up, which I very much enjoy as part of a balanced diet. A balanced diet. Although yeah. it's really funny that you, when you posted that, because I, it suddenly made me think I would be really curious out of all my photos on social media, like the proportion. <laughs> because <laughs> if it's over, you know, 20% of the ultra processed foods then Chris you you were right but I really much doubt it is <laughs> I bet it I bet it would be um so <laughs> Boris Johnson's got this whole ranch of anti-obesity policies most of which have never been tried I mean genuinely is like we're taking a, a step into the unknown with a lot of this stuff but there is a lot of them right and there's, there's an advertising ban a total online advertising ban pre-watch advertising ban telling shops they can't keep the so-called junk food at the entrance at the end of aisles at the checkouts a mandatory calorie labeling, uh, probably a few other things I, I can't even remember. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there, right? And assuming it all comes in, and it's all going to come in probably at the same time, can you promise us that in, say, five years' time, the obesity rate will be at least a little bit lower? <laughs> I would never dream of making such promises when I've definitely made it very clear that uh, to understand how these work in practice, we have to be able to monitor and evaluate them. But what you will, you need, so there are, this is what's so frustrating about kind of setting when you're dealing with such big complex issues, setting realistic uh, outcome metrics in the short, medium and long term. So like the soft drinks industry levy is a really good example to go back to. So yes, it was discussed in relation to the wider obesity prevalence, being part of the solution to that, et cetera, et cetera. But what are the kind of shorter term metrics directly related to health that have um, you know, profound impacts in terms of uh, dental cavities? You know, The number one reason why a child goes to A&E is to get their tooth, teeth extracted because of um, poor dental hygiene. Those are the sorts of shorter term metrics that can indicate that we're moving towards better health. And again, shifting away from the kind of over overly obsessed focus on weight and which is because the obesity crisis has been the frame since basically I mean uh, even before the UK government first started introducing obesity targets reduction targets in uh, 1991 1992 
um that's the frame but we really want to be it was framed by that it was framed like by the campaigners to be fair i don't remember anyone in public health say actually this isn't about obesity it's about tooth decay or just creating a general environment jamie oliver's on tv all the time saying we've got x number of uh overweight children and this is i think he said this is the single biggest thing the government could do to tackle childhood obesity it's and now, of, yeah. yeah, where is it, he now? It is, is he, changing. It, it is changing. And I wonder whether you've experienced or wh whether you're noticing that in terms of, and I, and I have been sort of talking to people about how much I really think we need to be moving towards that, focusing on understanding obesity as one outcome, one of many outcomes of a food system and environment that disproportionately focuses on certain types of food basically and um, how we can shift towards understanding it more as what is the world that we want how easy is it to live a healthy life that is enjoyable delicious nutritious all of it and I use examples of you know when I'm kind of talking to people about it when you go out into your daily life and you're <clears throat> I mean a really good example is when you're traveling on trains like how easy is it whenever you go to shops and train stations and vending machines or whatever to get your hands on really delicious healthy food and the answer is like it's not bloody easy at all because you, you can get delicious food though that's the main thing you got pasties <laughs> you got burger king you got those leon places now which sell basically junk food but it, it, it looks like it's healthy food there's loads there's never been more choice in the old days it used to be sandwiches and that was a lot i mean we can we can debate on that till the cows come home but uh, the proof is in the fact that you know, proof is in the pasty, as far as I'm concerned. 57% of the UK diet is is in the ultra processed category. That is because that is the norm. And um, and if we can go back to days when the majority of our of our diet was unprocessed or or minimally processed food and yeah, just turnips you know, and things like that, <laughs> boiled veg. Funny you to say that. I think I literally An have turnips <laughs> ready for cooking. Really. <laughs> oh. uh, let's finish by, by talking about one of your other bits of political activism, which is the 50-50 parliament. You're very keen to have a total gender balance in the House of Commons. Why are you so bothered about this? Why does it matter? I even find it amazing that I still have to, or we as a campaign still have to make the case that obviously politics should be open to everyone. <laughs> regardless. But it is open to everyone. It's just that, you know, different numbers of people stand for election and people vote in different ways. So the assumptions around, I mean, again, this is how to solve a problem and what, at what point do you start? All of those. Kind well, of what's the problem? First of all, what's the problem you, you, you think you've spotted here, which will be cured by having exactly the same number of men and women in parliament. I'm not against so, it. I just don't, I'm not convinced this really matters. I think so, most MPs are fairly useless regardless of their gender, you know? Well, we could get into a whole- and They don't represent me. I mean, you know, a male MP does not represent me any more than, you know, Jeremy Corbyn does not represent me more than Liz Truss just because he's a man, right? So the interesting thing that we come across, which again, a lot of the research shows, um, which in terms of why there are fewer women that tend to stand in elections compared to men, which we see repeatedly. And sadly, the local elections that just um, happened showed those rates again. I think the most um, in terms of regional metro mayor, locals, all of it together was like 25-ish percent um, uh, women candidates. And trying to understand why this is, you know, we get a lot of people being like, maybe women don't want to be politicians. <laughs> and we're like, oh, God, if you can have the conversations with how many women that we speak to about this sort of thing every day, we start to unpeel the multiple reasons why women don't tend to um, put themselves forward as much as... Well, come on, give us, give us a few of them quickly. So <clears throat> women tend to be socialised differently in terms of thinking about it, considering it as a career path, which is why we started the Ask It to Stand campaign, just to get people thinking when they're with an amazing woman, ask them. I mean, we, you know, I hope you have been doing the same with all your colleagues at the, <laughs> at the IEA. Um, and the structural barriers, so there can be very difficult, disproportionate um, impacts in terms of childcare, and we know that women still do the majority of that. So that can be a very real um, problem in terms of the actual job of an MP, the cost of it. 
Um, there are all sorts of things around the culture. So women tend to um, experience a disproportionately high amount of abuse, uh, trolling more so than men. In fact, I just spoke to a woman MP yesterday that said she's one of the many women MP that has the C word uh, graffitied on her um, association office. And compared to the number of men that get that, it is amazing how different there is. So there are all sorts of cultural, structural, socialized barriers that prevent women from thinking about it and it is it does it never ceases to amaze me how many amazing women in politics who i would assume obviously have thought about it and would consider themselves as yes amazing quality to go for it really don't and i feel like that kind of confidence building at a, at a kind of population level requires time so we are just relentlessly trying to make the case that don't forget when you're with an amazing woman to you know ask them if they have considered and to tell them why you think that they would be great so maybe Chris this should be your chance to do a shout out to a woman that comes to the top of your mind who should be thinking about it well you obviously Dolly <laughs> um, I assume this is all just laying the groundwork for you to get in on some old women shortlist god that would be so <laughs> bleak <laughs> and I can assure you it's not I, I take too much pleasure in seeing other people going in and facilitating that by by numbers I'll sit here and um, enjoy being in um the research seat. Thank you very much. That brings us right up to half an hour. Um, great speaking to you, Dolly. Take care. Hope to see you in the flash at some point in uh, in London in the next few weeks or months. Absolutely. Thank you very much for watching at home. Uh, thank you uh, in particular to all our Patreon subscribers and to our donors and of the Patreon subscribers. Particular thanks to James Byrne, Timothy Worrell and uh, Mark Edwards. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks. I'm not sure who with but I hope you'll join us again. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.